Um, thanks so much for joining us today for what I know is going to be a fantastic conversation. Uh, my name is Beth Tritter. I'm the Executive Director of the Primary Healthcare Performance Initiative, or PHCPI. PHCPI was established in 2015, and it's a partnership of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the World Health Organization, the World Bank, UNICEF, Ariadne Labs, and Results for Development. And we're dedicated to transforming the global state of primary health care, beginning with better measurement. We believe strong primary health care is the foundation of healthy societies and is critical to keeping people safe and healthy in times of crisis and calm. The damage wrought by COVID-19 has caused countries to reevaluate their health priorities, budgets, and systems, and has sparked conversation about how we as a global community can support stronger, more resilient health systems that effectively meet everyone's needs. At this moment of significant pain for us all, we're seeing how COVID and the measures taken to contain it threaten decades of progress made toward meeting people's pressing health needs. People affected by HIV faced persistent barriers to accessing comprehensive quality health services even before the pandemic, but the situation now is far more dire. We've all seen the WHO projections about a six month disruption in antiretroviral therapy leading to more than a half million deaths from causes related to HIV. And as of June, the Global Fund reported that 85% of HIV programs across 106 countries reported disruption to service delivery due to COVID. And the most vulnerable of those affected by HIV, including key and marginalized populations, women and adolescent girls, already face significant barriers to care even before the pandemic including hard to reach clinics, fragmented care, lack of community-based services, user fees, wait times, and stigma. We're hosting this set of conversations today because PHCPI believes strong primary health systems should provide the foundation for HIV care that is accessible, equitable, high quality, and most important, centered around people's needs. And primary health care should serve all people, including key and marginalized populations and the hardest to reach and should be able to help those with HIV also address their other health needs, including opportunistic infections and the growing burden of NCDs. So we wanna talk about how to make this a reality. At this moment, when COVID-19 has reinforced the danger that weak health systems beset by crisis can undermine even progress made over two decades of sustained global investment and attention, we wanted to bring together some important voices on primary health care and HIV, for a conversation about how we move together toward a future of high quality, comprehensive and integrated health for all. To that end, we have a tremendous lineup of speakers and panelists today, and I'm excited to get started, but before we do, I wanted to give a few housekeeping notes. Um, so first, uh, there's gonna be a link placed in the chat box with the full event agenda and speaker bios. That link also goes to the PHCPI website, which is www.improvingphc.org. So you can check it out either through the link or directly at our website. And that also includes relevant Twitter handles and we encourage you to continue the conversation on social media. We're also going to have two rounds of Q&A and you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom window to ask questions and to upvote other people's questions if you really wanna hear the answers to them. And please, if you can specify which panelists you'd like to address the question and we'll try to get to as many as we can. And at the end of the event, I'll tell you where we can continue the conversation for the questions I anticipate we, we won't have time to get to. And also know that the webinar is gonna be recorded and posted for later viewing and we'll send around a link to it when it's available. So first, um, getting started, I wanted to introduce our first speaker, who's going to offer some perspectives um, to get us, uh, us all thinking this morning or this afternoon. <laughs> um, Dr. Yogan Pillay uh, is country director of South Africa and senior global director for universal health coverage at the Clinton Health Access Initiative. He has a long-standing career advancing policies to achieve UHC and integrated services in South Africa, including for HIV, TB, maternal and child health, and NCDs. Dr. Pillay? Uh, Beth, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, thank you for the invitation to PHCPI as well as uh, the comments you made, uh, which I fully agree with. Uh, I wish to dedicate this brief input to the memory of Professor David Sanders, who passed on uh, 
uh, late last year. Uh, he has few peers as a PhD activist and I wish to honor him uh, during this event. As the pandemic has taken hold globally, the fragility of health systems in high, middle and low income countries has become clear as has the fragility of the global economy. The pandemic has also shown a spotlight on the intersection between life and livelihoods like never before. If we do not learn the lessons from this pandemic, then one wonders if the global community will ever learn. Regrettably, these lessons are not new. We should have learned these lessons as we enter the industrial age, when those like Chadwick and Virchow illustrated the links between the economy, politics, class, and health in the late to mid 1800s. As a South African, I cannot fail to also reference the work of Sydney and Emily Clark in their work that initiated the community health center movement in many parts of the world, commencing in KwaZulu-Natal. Their work predates the historic Alma Ata conference and declaration, which highlighted the social determinants of health, intersectoral collaboration, as well as community participation. Unfortunately, despite the case made for a comprehensive approach to primary health care at Alma Ata, subsequent events, including the roles played by the World Bank and IMF, the focus changed to a selective approach to PHC and the PHC package based largely on affordability, especially in low income countries. And this, in my mind, also had the consequence of further entrenching the medical model. We have spoken much about the principles adopted at Alma Ata, such as comprehensive care, including promotion and prevention, universal and equitable access based on need, community participation, as well as stakeholder participation in co-creating health, including policies and monitoring implementation, intersectoral action on health and social determinants on health, etc. Many thought that the Global Conference on Primary Healthcare in Almaty in 2018 will help us reinvent Almaty. However, despite the rhetoric of Almaty and the subsequent UN high-level meeting on universal health coverage in 2019, it is unclear that much has changed in the conceptualization, financing, implementation, and dare I say monitoring of primary health care as envisaged at Almaty more than 40 years ago. This pessimism was highlighted in a commentary on primary health care published in The Lancet by David Sanders and others last year, titled, and I quote, From Primary Health Care to Universal Health Coverage, One Step Forward and Two Steps Back. I think that the issues raised in this commentary are extremely important and worthy of surfacing at this event. David and his colleagues reminded us that, and I quote, PHC was unlikely to succeed without the establishment of a new international economic order based on ensuring rights of states and peoples under colonial domination to restitution and full compensation for their exploitation and that of their resources, regulation of transnational cooperation, preferential treatment of low income and middle income countries in areas of international economic cooperation, transfer of new technologies, and an end to the waste of natural resources." End quote. In uncovering the false dichotomy between communicable and non-communicable diseases, the COVID pandemic has rudely reminded us of this intersection. Most who regrettably died were multimorbid. They had hypertension, diabetes, were obese, etc. In this context, I must note the impact of processed foods in the fast food sector, which generates significant profits, but at a huge cost to our health, as well as its impact on the environment. Whilst all food production, for example, would require water, we know that producing one kilogram of wheat requires significantly less water than one kilogram of beef and other animal products. Issues like the deforestation of the Amazon is also related to food production, which we need to consider when we decide which foods to produce and which foods to consume. This means a focus on planetary health as much as diseases and conditions that affect humans, uh, which is the subject of our discussion today. Turning to human health, while 600 million people globally are living in poverty and 2 billion people suffer from micronutrient deficiencies, we have, on the other hand, more than 1.9 billion adults 18 years 
and older who are overweight. Of these, 650 million are obese. 38 million children under the age of five are overweight or obese. And 340 million children and adolescents aged five to 19 years of age were overweight or obese when measured in 2016. Obesity is preventable and a strong primary health care platform can contribute to its prevention. With respect to diabetes, the number of people with diabetes rose from 108 million in 1980 to 422 million in 2014. Diabetes prevention has been rising more rapidly in low and middle income countries than in high income countries and is a major cause, as we know, of blindness, kidney failure, heart attacks, stroke, and lower limb amputation. We know what needs to be done to prevent and delay the onset at least of diabetes type two, and this can be done effectively at primary healthcare. Hypertension significantly increases the risk of heart attacks, strokes, kidney failure, blindness, and premature death. Of the estimated 1.13 billion people who have hypertension, it is regrettable that less than one in five of these people are controlled. We know that the major contributors to hypertension are unhealthy diets, physical inactivity, and the consumption of alcohol and tobacco. These are preventable and primary health care has a large role to play in its prevention. If many diseases and conditions are preventable, either through proper sanitation, as Chadwick showed us in the 1980s, in the context of communicable diseases, and as numerous studies have shown many non-communicable diseases can also be prevented with strong primary health care system. The question is, why is this challenge not been accepted? And why is it that many low, middle and high income countries still have such high levels of both communicable and non-communicable diseases? It is clear to me at least that an exclusive focus on a medical model approach to health will not help and improve the health of the world's population. These conditions are related to the food that we produce, market and profit from, as well as the social and economic conditions of modern life. Primary health care and indeed health systems more generally must therefore confront the impact of the commercial and social determinants of health. Can the current focus on universal health coverage get us the primary health care system that we all so desire? This was the hope that Almaty and the UN high level meeting presented us with. While I believe that these were very important events and that they do offer us with the opportunity for more progressive primary health care, there are several danger signs as highlighted in David's commentary when they said, and I quote, with unprecedented threats to population and planetary health, the declaration of Astana would have been more, should have been more honest older and an inspirational guide to those working under increasingly difficult conditions to make equity a reality. Replacing the lodestar of primary health care with universal health coverage threatens to be one step forward and two steps back for health policy. So what needs to be done? For me, a focus on primary health care means much more than universal health coverage or as it is abbreviated for many, universal health coverage, which for, for many means insurance and insurance-based system. It means, however, that we must focus on the impact of human existence on the planet. I fully acknowledge that this may be argued to be a tall order for community health, for the community health worker, the nurse, the pharmacist, or the doctor that, to consider in their daily practices. What this event and similar events should do is to make it possible for us to consider these issues in our daily lives and practices in the health sector and beyond. We have to become activists in every sphere of life and primary health care, I believe, lends itself to fostering and facilitating this. To achieve its promise, we need, to set, we need a set of measurement metrics that goes beyond health indicators to which we can all be accountable. In conclusion, there is much fragmentation in our responses. We have a PHC movement, a universal health coverage movement, an NCD movement, an HIV movement, a commercial determinants of health movement, 
and most recently a planetary health movement, and I'm sure there are many others. There are many synergies amongst us and these particular movements, and it's time for us to leverage these synergies to tackle the key drivers of poor health, starting with primary health care, providing the fullest possible package of service, and ensuring that every sector is involved in co-creating health with the people that we so want to be as healthy as possible to achieve their fullest potential. I thank you for this opportunity to make these few remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to Dr. Pillay for those remarks. Um, I, I love the, um, the idea of, of co-creating health um, and think that's a, an interesting theme to, to touch on today. Um, and I hope that uh, our next speakers can pick up some of the, the themes um, in Dr. Pillay's remarks as well um, and, and bring them uh, also back to, to some of the core themes around how we now better create an integrated approach to, to health co-creation um, and to addressing people's health needs. Um, I think that the, the imagery of there being all these different movements for every single thing um, and the need to bring those together under a common umbrella and under a common and purpose is is very uh, is is very powerful, um, and so I hope we can explore some of those themes uh, as as our program goes on. Um, I want to introduce our next speakers, uh, Lillian Moreco and Dr. Shabir Musa. First, uh, Lillian is the executive director of the International Community of Women Living with HIV in Eastern Africa. She is a self-described go-getter uh, and is a, a gender human rights and women's rights activist, passionate about women's access to prevention, care, treatment, and support services for HIV. Um, and Dr. Shabir Musa is the president of the African Forum for Primary Health Care uh, and is a physician and primary health care advocate with a longstanding commitment to improving quality of care, building resilient health systems, and achieving health for all. So Shabir and Lillian, um, I wanted to thank you for being with us today. Uh, and building on uh, Dr. Pillay's remarks, uh, we're excited for both of you to lend your expertise with community level advocacy and direct service delivery to today's conversation. So at the center of our conversation today is the opportunity to better integrate primary health care and HIV prevention treatment and care, particularly for key populations and the challenges to doing that. Can you each start us off by talking some specifics about where you've seen success in greater integration working for affected populations uh, and where you've maybe seen it happen less successfully? Ladies first. Lillian. <laughs> thank you so much. And uh, thank you, Dr. Fili, for setting uh, the stage. I think I wanted to start by speaking uh, at the point that uh, our first speaker raised, and, and that is financing. And uh, I want to just emphasize and start by saying that uh, if you talk about integration, if you talk about primary health care, it, it is important that we talk about financing. And uh, what we seemingly see is that we are seeing a lot of integration at implementation level, but when it comes to financing and resource allocation, it becomes a big challenge and therefore it impacts uh, the implementation level. But having said that, I would like to say that, uh, and I think from everything that he's saying, uh, it is important that we talk about integration because there's no way we are going to get to achieve anything unless we integrate services so that we are looking at the human being as a whole and that we are using our people-centered approaches to deliver services to this one individual who is impacted by the different uh, conditions that have just been mentioned. And therefore, in terms of success, what does it mean when we talk about uh, success in integration? And I just want to give um, one of the examples that uh, we all very well know that, uh, for example, when we talk about elimination of mother to child transmission, it is at the point when there was integration, where everybody came on board, where we brought even the key affected populations and groups like women living with HIV, that were able to begin seeing results, where we moved away from focusing on a child who is born HIV negative to focusing on women who were giving birth to these babies and putting them at the center that we started seeing the results that uh, we are now uh, speaking about. But I also want to talk about um, 
the key populations, and I want to talk about uh, integration from that point, that uh, for example, in Uganda and, and Kenya, we are having DICs, uh, centers that are specifically being run and managed by the key populations themselves. And in terms of service provision, there's quite a lot of services that are being uh, given. For example, there's testing, there's STI screening, there's PrEP, there's uh, networking that key populations come in this center and speak to each other and provide peer support to each other. And we see it's successful because of one, that it is uh, community led. The communities affected themselves are leading that uh, center, are at the center of designing and implementation and even monitoring how services are implemented. And, and therefore, for successful integration, communities must be at the center. They must be in charge of what is provided in terms of services. They must be able to have access to resources so that they are able to contribute to the process. And I want to also speak to, I think Dr. Fili talked about um, the services that are being provided, but who provides the services? We know that these are healthcare providers, but the question that I think we need to ask ourselves is how much investment have we put in them? If most of the people that are providing services at the level where primary health care is happening are women and girls, and they are doing it voluntarily, then how can we be talking about a successful primary health care intervention? And therefore we must invest resources where they are needed. So I can stop here and allow my colleague to add on. Thank you, Lillian. Um, and thank you, Beth and, uh, and uh, PHCPI for organizing this and uh, honored by the invitation. I think uh, what Lillian had just talked about in terms of financing, I think is, is really important. And, the point that um, uh, Jogan brought uh, forward, what, what he said about the fragility of the economy versus health uh, priorities, um, life versus livelihoods. I think that's um, not just a question of um, the difficulties that is imposed on us, but the opportunity that it shows us as well. I think everyone now realizes there's a price to health that lack of health, that the challenges of a poor health system are very dire indeed. They're not limited to those sick people who are out of mind and out of sight. And I think that is one of the opportunities we have to in fact put forward the idea to politicians. And I really appreciate that uh, point that is raised that in the UHC movement, there's a serious cha challenge um, that PHC may not be as central to it as it should. And in South Africa, we really uh, I really appreciated the uh, statements that were made initially that primary health care is the heart of the UHC movement in South Africa, the NHI. Um, but in the, in the subsequent bill uh, that actually is coming before parliament, for some reason that's disappeared. And, uh, you know, um, it's, it's curious, what is the exact way in which UHC will translate? And I'm a fan of primary health care. I'm a primary health care physician a family physician. And one of the challenges I have is that where, where I've seen, South Africa has been very successful. Dr. Pele has been part of that in terms of a UHC uh, of some sort delivered in South Africa in 1994, where we moved from an apartheid system to at least some basic health care available to people within five kilometers from 1994. And then the other change that happened in 2008 was the delivery of HIV um, treatment to people in large scale. And today we have the largest program. But I think that itself has shown the challenge that um, this medical, verticalized medical approach uh, by disease-based thinking is in fact very flawed indeed. And I think in South Africa that, uh, you know, became uh, known and there was a push to integrate, uh, integrate those HIV service, normal services, and it, it failed. And in fact, if I were to look at, and, and, and I think decision makers need to be very frank about it, the truth is that the success of the South African HIV program has happened despite the difficulties of the public health system. And so there's a serious flaw in the structure of the health system. Today, my experience as a family physician in Soweto, responsible by, um, you know, by the Department of Health said, please help us to try and ensure that the outcomes, the clinical outcomes are actually uh, achieved in terms of HIV care, especially. We found that the partners who have literally had made the program happen in South Africa that were then trying to make it integrated could only make it succeed by taking it out again. 
And that's really what's happening, is that the health system is actually the serious problem. And if I had to ask integration, how integration is thought of, it is, and we can talk about integration, but managers talk about integration around themselves. How do I integrate it around my management system? Not asking the question, how do I integrate it around the patient and their experience? And I think that it really is a huge paradigm shift for them to think like that. Um, I've, I've actually been really unhappy as a family physician in Johannesburg, working with that and seeing just how partition the care, the care uh, uh, pathway between nurses and doctors have been. And I think that to me has been a big challenge. As a family physician, I'm a big fan of team. Uh, and I think often a time we as family physicians rail against the medical, biomedical establishment of specialists and hospitals. But at the same time, we find ourselves in PHC being very marginalized as the medics, the doctors. Yet we are talking about team-based approaches, community-based approaches, not just delivering care in a narrow, narrow space. And in South Africa, we're not taken very seriously. So in Soweto, where I am, I actually said, let, let us see whether we can talk to what family medicine is talking about. And uh, Dr. Uh, Yoganis referred to the Kaks. They were doctors who went out into this community in the 1940s in our attempt in South Africa to set up a national health service like the US had, the UK had. And in doing that, they actually said that we, and the two innovations they came up with, one was a, a CHC to say, how can we deliver care to 30,000 with two doctors? They said, we can't do it alone. We've got to actually build up the team, which is medical aides, nurses, who are going to task shift and manage that whole range to give medical service to this population. The actual second innovation they came up with was that of community-oriented primary care. And that is the real innovation because they turned around and said, you know what, as medics, this is not care. Medical, medical care is not all care. We have to think of upstream problems and what we have to do is look at the way in which we deal with communities in a much more integrated fashion. So what they did is build around the patient that they had, and that was just 1,000 out of the 30,000, that they developed this model of COPC. So let's build up 1,000 people, give them the care we think should be given, with good record keeping, with the care in the community. And in Shawelo, in Soweto, we've tried to replicate that. And essentially, it has been saying, how do we get with community health workers and other means to engage with the population, building them into a panel that is clearly accountable. I know who belongs to my practice, as opposed to just people wandering around and going to wherever they can. And the second thing is I look at the service and with the community health worker, very attached to me and my service, how do I make that service very linked to the patient, but also high quality? And a whole lot of issues that can be dealt with. And that's not just me as a doctor, but a PHC nurse, a team, uh, a clinical associate, everyone as part of that team with the community of work. And then the three or two other things is how do I engage with stakeholders? How do I make them central own this and actually decide what is important? Because often what we think important is not what they think important. And together with the information from those quarters, build a prevention strategy. And that needs to be very nuanced. That not only thinks about medical approaches, but thinks about um, social determinants of health. How do I impact on the health and the education level in that community? But this is the training that we as family for family doctors in South Africa try to impart to our trainees. And unfortunately, it's misinterpreted as, as we're doctors, we're actually talking the medical model. I think that if I were to look at the drivers of success and what really is the, is the challenge, the structural barrier, is that management in South Africa, and I think in most of Africa, is that it, it thinks of hospital care in a particular way and often are suckered into actually doing that more than it should. And then primary health care as well, that cheap thing we can get done at the littlest of cost. And they don't really prioritize it. But when they do, they want the cheapest kind of way that they do it. And they don't realize that, that if we want to really pro provide universal coverage that protects us against a COVID or the future that might behold another COVID, we need to strengthen primary health care and do it properly. And it is not impossible to do. So saying shortage of doctors, is just not good enough an answer to talk about how we get structured pre teamwork that's community oriented in the community. So my big fan, my big approach is if the NHI comes along, I'm saying, where's the COPC in it? How are we actually building teamwork that's stru properly structured? And how do we make the community central? And that's not gonna happen anymore than building panels, small communities. That's why community practice is what I'm talking about. 
communities that belong to a team, even a community health center, as we have in South Africa, are very nebulous in the way they treat people. People are just numbers and they just walk through the clinic door as a number in the scheme of things. And to me, that's just not community orientation, despite using the name community health center. Thank you, Shabir. And I, uh, sorry, Lillian, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted actually to add to what Professor is saying and uh, to emphasize that uh, all the good things that he's talking about cannot happen until or unless the environment is conducive for the communities that we are talking about. Because we see that in most parts of the, of the world and in Africa, for example, there's a lot of criminal laws. Uh, key populations, people living with HIV and AIDS are criminalized. And therefore, even if you had the best services put together in one center, they will not access them. And therefore, we shall continue to register the kind of situation that we see because people are fearing for their lives. If you have uh, services for diabetes, for, you know, hypertension for HIV and now COVID and, and, and they are good and they are in one place and in one facility but you have key populations, you have sex workers who are fearing who are going to be rounded up and put in prison like we've seen in Uganda then uh, we are doing nothing because people will not come for these services and therefore the legal environment must be conducive so in, in, in in some kind of recommendation, I would like to say that, uh, and especially now with COVID, that we are seeing that we are all in this. We need a favorable environment that allows every human being, every individual, irrespective of who they are, irrespective of where they live, to be free to access the services so that we are all able to live healthy lives. And therefore, policymakers, we need to come up with laws that are pro-people, people-centered and that people are able to get out and access services of what you. That was a great point. I, I actually, um, and, and I think it, it also links back to um, what, uh, what Dr. Pillay was saying earlier in terms of the, the multi-sectoral approach. I think the, the legal sector is another sector we don't often think about when we're, when we're thinking about multi-sectoral approaches to achieving strong primary health care. But um, as you raise, Lillian, that's a really important one. I wanted to ask um, if, if you could um, talk a little bit more about the community-run health centers that you were referencing and how they have dealt with the COVID, the disruptions due to COVID um, in terms of continuing to provide um, care to the people who access care at those centers um, and also um, thinking through perhaps uh, once, once this disruption is over, um, how, to, how to provide, to continue to provide uh, more sort of integrated and, and full services. I think Lillian, perhaps I can- And I think you're on respond. mute. Yeah. Uh, would you like me to respond or Lillian? It was, uh, I was asking about Lillian, the, the community health centers that Lillian was referencing specifically in her earlier remarks. Okay. Yeah, so these are the drop-in centers uh, that are providing services uh, to key populations uh, specifically. And uh, of course they were disrupted uh, by COVID-19 to the extent that, uh, of course, uh, when, for example, in Uganda, we had a total lockdown, uh, services were being delivered on the door. Uh, and probably uh, that is also another discussion for another day to the extent that uh, it, it took us long to get to know how then services could be delivered to these groups of people. And, and the community itself was, you know, it was not integrated, even when we came up with uh, programs when we came up with the task forces that were dealing with the COVID-19, there was nobody who remembered that we already have a structure, we already have a community that has been working on HIV that needed to be integrated so that we are delivering services comprehensively. So we were having these uh, two structures, uh, you know, running parallel until when communities came out to say, we need to get out and deliver services to our people. And, and of course, it was very hard because one, you needed to get permission uh, from the resident district commissioner who, of course, probably was living far from uh, the community person. But uh, it, it speaks to the issue that we are talking about, that if we look at an individual as a whole and we look at what services they need and how they can be integrated and delivered in a multi-sector approach and a comprehensive approach, then we are better off. Because even when we started delivering services and government started doing 
that, for example. Then we remember, we forgot that there were other sectors that we were leaving behind. The education sector, where a majority of young people are, they also needed the, uh, to be integrated. They also needed services, but nobody was remembering that. But also for the uh, populations like people living with HIV, even when ARVs and other uh, medicines were being delivered, there was nobody who cared about their nutritional support. And, and then it speaks to how come we did not remember that all this was needed. It's just because we are working in isolation, dealing with issue per issue without looking at the comprehensiveness of the needs uh, of the people. So I, I, I guess the point is integration must be, must place people at the center. And there's no way we can integrate if the people that we are serving are not at the table discussing with us because they know what they need, they know what they can contribute, and therefore when we come up with programs and policies, they'll be in relation to what the needs of the people are. So people-centered programming, uh, decision-making, mm -hmm. policy-making is very, very important. Over to you. Sorry, I was muted. Um, we're going to need to, to wrap up um, fairly soon, uh, but there were actually two questions that were on the Q&A. Oh, now the, now the questions are no longer answered. So I guess we're going to have to grab them a little bit later. Um, but I guess I, I would ask um, if, if either of you have uh, any very brief closing thoughts um, to take us into the next panel. Um, which I, I hope we'll talk a bit more about the policies and um, sort of management side of, uh, of actually um, sort of integrating quality service delivery. If I can just respond, I think the, you know, the, 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 there's always a challenge that we use the word, um, let's put people at the center of it. You know, that's the politician uh, talking. You know, we, we want you, you are the center of our attention. But when it gets to actual governing, it's, it's trickle down. And eventually it's very fragmented. And as a clinician looking after a small community of 30,000 in, in Shawello, I've actually tried to build um, multi-sectoral collaboration, intersectoral collaboration in that setting around these community, this community. And it's been enormously challenging to get that kind of thing happening, to try and get the Department of Education to come forward so that we can talk between them and in fact the Department of Sports about how we can roll out a, and, and the health and see how we can roll out an exercise program for students as pupils at schools was a mission because the mentality on the ground is that is it's a top-down integration so the politicians must make these decisions and if there's integration it's a policy that comes down telling you this is how you do it and it trusts nothing of the healthcare worker that has the nature himself of managing a person to be said let's reorient you think slightly differently don't think biomedically think a little broadly but manage a population with the, with a completeness where you're not just treating what walks through the door you're actually are treating the population. So I think that even what Lillian says, in a community health center, in a COPC setting, you would not be, that's the exact point in trying to look at that center, is to say, don't treat the people only you walk through the door. Say who belongs to this practice, who is in this community, and who is not coming to us. That's the person we should be focusing on. And that's why when we gather information, whether it is from the population out there with community health workers or other means of gathering population data, or the service we provide, or the stakeholder engagement, this is to understand what's going on out there and say, building up priorities, understanding who really needs the help and not waste it needlessly on just waste, we're sitting at the door and saying, well, let's walk them in. Because that's the extent of the current care of the health system in South Africa, even with the community health workers roaming around. I've been busy trying to uh, respond to the you know, COVID crisis in so Soweto, uh, as you asked, how do you actually do that? And we've said, let's triage. The community health workers from the place I work in actually stepped in to help the CHC as a whole. Now we've been asked to try and deal with the fact that patients can't be managed at the facility we want to do chronic care. What we've been doing years ago for about two, three years, but was then crushed by managers who don't like anything that's different. We were delivering medicines with the community health workers. Suddenly the norm, the, 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 the need is around. Suddenly they're saying, Prof Musa, can't you help us organize this delivery by community health workers? 
or you put together the, the, the whole thing and hopefully it works. But it is, it is really, it does need a crisis for us to listen to ideas where people on the ground, clinicians and people who are in, are you know, in touch, a front line, the whole team can deliver to the care, to the patient, but they need to be you know, empowered. I think Lillian says, give them the capacity. And I think people can do things. And politicians and senior managers who are considered just as much politician need to listen very carefully to that. Um, really important lessons from both of you. I think actually a lot of, uh, I, I hear sort of violent agreement from both of you about, about a, few, uh, a few key um, and passionate agreement, which is wonderful to hear. Um, and I think that there's a lot, a lot of good territory to be explored in the future about how to better integrate, um, how to better integrate, not integrate community voices, but how to, how to put communities in the lead um, in pursuing integration strategies um, so that integration is something that's actually focused uh, for people, focused on people um, and, uh, and designed by people as opposed to designed by managers and then imposed on people. Um, you have both spoken really passionately and, uh, and strongly about that today and I thank you. Um, so uh, we're gonna now move on um, to our next panel um, in, uh, in today's uh, event. And for that, I want to um, hand over the floor to uh, Dr. Lisa Hirschhorn, um, who's a fantastic colleague of ours um, at PHCPI uh, through her affiliation with Ariadne Labs, which is a core partner of PHCPI, um, and also has an affiliation um, with, uh, with Northwestern University um, School of Medicine. Um, Lisa has worked for three decades to study and improve the effectiveness and quality of care uh, uh, in the United States and uh, in low and middle income countries in HIV, primary care, maternal and child health, and NCDs. Um, and we felt she was the perfect person to moderate the next conversation. So with that, I will hand it over to Lisa to introduce the panelists um, and moderate uh, our panel. Great, thank you so much, Beth. And thanks so much for the invitation from uh, PHCPI. I'm really absolutely delighted and honored to be moderating this panel. Um, just a, a couple of few words. I actually started as an HIV physician back in the 1980s, uh, working in a community health center. And a lot of this is really resonating in terms of how do we think, rethink the role of primary health care to increase the uh, ability to respond to people's needs with HIV, not as a disease, but as an individual, as has already been discussed. Um, now, during pandemics, but also in the future. So first, let me introduce um, the, my three panelists. Uh, our plan is to, I have a couple of questions that I'm gonna sort of pose, and some of these have already also been posted, and then save some time to, uh, to answer additional questions from, uh, from the audience. So uh, I'd let, first like to introduce uh, Sonia Floris, who is a Senior Fund Portfolio Manager at the Global Fund to Fight HIV, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. Sonia is a global health professional dedicated to ensuring access to treatment for people living with HIV across the African continent. I'm also delighted to, uh, to introduce a, a, a close colleague, uh, Dr. Anthony Afusu. He is the Deputy Director General of Ghana Health Services, and Dr. Afusu is a physician and public health researcher committed to strengthening health systems in Ghana through data and measurement. And finally, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Laurel Sprague, who is the Chief of Community Mobilization, Community Support, Social Justice, and Inclusion Department at UNAIDS. Dr. Sprague is a passionate social justice activist, educator, researcher, with a long career championing the human rights of marginalized populations living with HIV. What I'd like to do is first actually pose both a, a question um, to all the panelists, maybe if you could each answer in two or three minutes. And I think, uh, as everybody is aware, is that, that COVID-19 has, has revealed significant weaknesses in health systems around the world, really exacerbating issues around disparities for everybody living with chronic disease, but particularly for vulnerable populations among people living with HIV. And this is both for people's willingness to access care, but also their ability to access care. What role do you think uh, the strong primary health care can play in meeting the needs of the HIV community now and beyond the pandemic? And particularly, what successes are you seeing emerging? And I'm going to first ask Sonia if you could respond. Thank you very much, Dr. Lisa. Thank you. I'm very delighted to be part of this uh, uh, webinar this afternoon. Uh, to respond to the, to the question, 
from the global fund point of view, um, I would say that the global fund 2017-2022 uh, strategy, investing in to end epidemics, places uh, building resilient and sustainable systems for health and promoting and protecting human rights and gender equality as core objectives. It explicitly recognizes that building strong health system is essential for achieving uh, universal health coverage and ensuring global health security, particularly in the context of the current COVID-19 pandemic. Importantly, the strategy uh, of the Global Fund underscores uh, the critical relationship between existing in disease specific programs to advance the fight against the epidemics of HIV, but also TB and malaria, and investing in building resilient and sustainable systems for health, particularly primary health care as a foundation to maximize health impact with together ensure sustainability and in increase uh, efficiency. The health system and primary health care revival, I would say for West and Central Africa, West Africa, um, uh, with a revival started with, with uh, the Ebola uh, epidemic in 2014, 2016, uh, particularly at community level. Countries like Liberia, Sierra Leone, or Guinea had to strengthen their community system, their community uh, health systems, uh, with uh, uh, strengthening the community networks to respond to the Ebola epidemic. Uh, looking at uh, uh, the country that I'm managing at the Global Fund, which is Mali in West Africa, I would say that Mali uh, entered in a major health system reform in early 2019 with a strong focus on primary health care. The, the reform focuses on improving maternal and child mortality through a fundamental primary health care restructuring and uh, gets health, service, health services closer to people who need them. The main activities include the reorganization of the primary healthcare centers uh, with policies and legislative changes regarding the, the community health facility structure. The creation of an integrated network of frontline community health workers, but not only the community health workers, but also a strengthening of a network of civil society, uh, community-based organization and KP's organization at the community level to be able to provide tailored services to uh, key population and marginalized uh, groups. So the expectation of this reform is to have a significant direct impact on maternal and child health and increased cost effectiveness of disease-specific investments, including HIV programming and uh, qualitative um, decentralized integrated package of care and treatment at community level. This, I would say, is more of the public, public side of the, of the uh, primary health care, and we can talk more on the community side. And I will, I will end, uh, end here for the moment. Thank you. Many, many, many thanks, Anita. That's really great and a really fantastic ability to talk about everything from the policy down to the uh, really local community level, this sort of uh, we talk about integration of care, but also integration of the response. Uh, uh, Dr. Fusu, Tony, I know that you're, Anthony, your um, video is not strong enough. Uh, so you may be joining us with video or without, but we'd love to hear your comments. And can you hear us? Hello. Yes, can you, can you hear me please? Yes. Yeah. Okay, on the question of, about how COVID is impacting services in Ghana, I mean, and the issue of integration, I mean, COVID has had real impact on service delivery and that's something that we're looking at in terms of the outpatients, in terms of, I mean, the other programs, immunization, antenatal deliveries. And I think it's two sides of it. There's a fear of, I mean, both, I mean, they are both the demand side and the supply side of the issue. On the demand side, you find that, I mean, the fear of the coming to the facility and getting infected, I mean, because of the education about COVID that's gone and they're thinking that those who are ill with COVID are in the facilities. 
Although we have treatment centers and other places, there's still that apprehension of coming into our facilities. So that one has really affected service uh, uptake. And then on the, I mean, on the supply side also, the health workers also feel some apprehension about offering service because sometimes PPEs, PPEs are not enough so that they don't feel protected enough and they feel afraid of the public and getting infected. So on both sides, you find this happening. But then, I mean, we, we, we saw it earlier. By looking at the data, we saw it earlier. So we're trying to sort of deal with it by putting out some I mean, communication to the general public about the safety protocols that have been put into place. So a lot of health education is going on trying to let the people know the safety protocols that have been put into place in the, in the hospitals to safeguard them. And then also on the, I mean, uh, the supply side also trying to provide the needed PPEs. In fact, the government of Ghana sort of got private uh, companies involved and either some of the things that were imported are now being manufactured locally. So surgical masks, I mean, uh, facials, et cetera, are being made available. And then also trying to provide clear guidance. In fact, that's a document that we're working on, guidance on providing service during this period. So that guidance is being provided, setting up pre-charging at the service center, and also trying to integrate the service such that it's like when a woman comes in, let's say, for, with a, a child for child welfare clinic, then if the woman needs family planning services, the family planning services are provided so that you reduce the contact period as much as possible. So in fact, I mean, integration really being driven by the, I mean, our need to respond to COVID. I mean, and I think there's something that is good going forward. And I think, I mean, and what at the higher level of finance, I mean, level also, I'm the Deputy Director General of Ghana Service, and boss, the Director General has asked me to look at service continuity. That's what I do full time. But he concentrates on responding to COVID. So, the, I mean, at the high level of governance, they are the, in the leader of the Ghana Health Service, the Director General of the Ghana Health Service deals with the COVID situation. And I, as his deputy, is looking at the service continuity effect. So, we win a lot of work about the guidance we've stopped e-learning platforms where we are training health workers or guidance and that need to be done. And then also trying to follow up more than the indicator to see what there are changes. And in fact, we've seen changes now. Immunization has started picking up again. Yes, immunization has started picking up again. The seasonal malaria chemophylaxis, we've started, we, we, we stopped it, but we've started seasonal malaria chemophylaxis again. Yeah, and then we are we are going to respond. We had some polio outbreaks from vaccine derived polio uh, paralysis in some of the children that we are dealing with. That one too, we picked it up again. So a lot of the things coming up again, all the safety protocols being put in place to reassure the public of the safety and reassure the health workers of, of their safety. I think that's what I can say to that part. Great. Thank you so much. And I think really important bringing out that it's not just the supply side or the demand side, you have to do both of them. And it's a very interesting and I think important thing about leadership, the fact that you have leaders who are responding to COVID, but also leaders who are then, as I call it, responding to the response uh, of, of COVID in terms of mitigating, uh, mitigating the impact on primary care and HIV. Um, Dr. Sprague wanted to give you also an opportunity to, uh, to respond. Um, thank you very much, and, and really, um, it's a pleasure and honor to be here and to follow all of the, the five speakers who've gone before me. It, it, I'm, I'm, I'm inspired. I'll, I'll try not to repeat anything that's been said, but I have a few things I'd like to add um, from the perspective of UNAIDS, where our uh, main responsibility in the world is to, is to end the AIDS epidemic and to look after and try to promote uh, what's needed for the health and well-being of people living with HIV. And it's absolutely right that the COVID epidemic has been devastating for people living with HIV um, in, in country after country after country. And I'd like to say at the outset that 
from our regional and country offices and from our work directly with communities of people living with HIV, it is absolutely clear that in many, if not most countries of the world over the last six months, people with HIV would not have their medications and would not be surviving um, to the extent that they are if it weren't for community health delivery. So community-led organizations, um, often PLHIV networks um, that were already providing health services, but sometimes people living with HIV networks that were existing as peer support networks, finding ways to um, navigate systems, um, sometimes um, really, as, as, as Lillian described, having to navigate, getting permission even to leave their homes in order to get medications, um, sometimes um, for, you know, for dozens of their fellow uh, members of the network, and then delivering those sometimes on foot, sometimes on motorbikes, sometimes by car. So uh, it's been remarkable to see what community mobilization has done um, in this really difficult time. In terms of advantages of, of primary health care, which is part of the question of, uh, you know, for the HIV response, I think we've also seen um, the real advantages of, of primary health care services being close to people and, and able to be very much people-centered at their best. And in fact, from some of our regions, um, including from the Middle East, North, Middle East and North Africa region, we started to hear reports that people who had, people with HIV who had um, maybe avoided public health hospitals, um, we're starting to, to really increase their trust in government and public provided services under COVID. And we're seeing a bit of, so seeing a bit of a change and maybe more of a willingness to move toward private or sorry, to uh, uh, primary health centers for, um, to, in order to receive care because of, of an increase in trust. Um, but we also see that, um, at, and this is a continuing problem that people living with HIV in all of our diversity have to uh, have to, to believe that uh, that they'll be safe when they go to these primary health centers, um, and that needs to be demonstrated. There's good reason that people are afraid, um, and so I think it really needs to be demonstrated that that they're safe both in terms of fear of infection, um, as Dr. Opuso was saying um, in Ghana. We've seen that in other countries as well that people are afraid of acquiring HIV or acquiring COVID. Um, when they go to a health center, but also fear of stigma, discrimination, criminalization, even violence. And we have seen again and again, even outside of COVID, um, that, that year after year after year, even in 2020, people living with HIV are actually denied health care specifically because of their health status, their HIV status. Um, some countries from four, around 4% 4 of people per year, other countries in excess of 40% of people living with HIV who are surveyed. A report being uh, denied HIV care at least once in the last year. So, so there are real challenges, um, especially when we move out of HIV specific spaces. Um, and, and I just want to again also emphasize something that Lillian I think highlighted very well that, that we do need to ask you know, who provides the services. Um, and, and that, that uh, Professor Musa also uh, I think said very clearly that being based in a community is not enough, community based isn't enough. Um, but we need to have a connection with the community and within UNAIDS, and we've worked with um, Lillian and ICW East Africa and others uh, to really promote community-led service, service delivery, community-led monitoring and accountability and communities engagement and, and governing processes. And um, we can talk more about that later if people are interested, but I think it's relevant to, to include in the discussion of uh, primary health coverage and, and meeting the needs of people living with HIV. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Please. So I think we're, we're really hearing um, some of the already strengths of, of primary care and not just facility, but really community-based, as well as sort of how COVID is driving further integration. So um, Dr. Fuso, I actually have a, a question for you, which is um, the community-based health planning and services or the CHIPS system in Ghana is frequently cited as an exemplar approach to primary care service delivery and community engagement in primary health care. And I, I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about um, sort of the integration of people living with HIV at the primary care level before COVID and now continuing it um, during the constraints of the pandemic. So Dr. Afuso, to you, and it's okay if, you're, uh, if your bandwidth is not enough. Um, oh, no, we get to see you as well. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Uh, I think what I'll say is, some of bit of the integration work goes in beyond the COVID. Um, the community-based health planning and services in Ghana is the lowest level of 
for public delivery, like the pre-care, where you will nest a community of nurses who is a trained health worker and who is there at that level, offering all the real services. In fact, that's real integrated service. Because they offer clinical service, they offer, I mean, a pr a promotive, inventive, immunization, family planning, antenates, a real integrated service. I mean, so, I mean it is integrated, really embedded in the way that they the challenge with initial programs at like HIV TB were very program specific and very hospital centered. But then we saw, and they saw the programs all that there was barrier in terms of geographical accessibility because I mean, not everybody can come to the hospital on quite a regular basis for missing refill, like for the HIV. I mean, because they, they may not always need to come to do the labs. All they need to do is refill. So then for the last two or three years, there's been training of all the community of nurses to cooperate with the care that is provide fills, refills for the patients so that at least maybe like uh, they can come to the facility and get their medicines refilled them and which is closer to their home. And then occasionally be a quarter, so, and then the community nurse has also been trained to count for some of the side effects, so that if there is any version of the side effect, then quickly the community nurse will refer the patient to the. Other than that, you continue to fill to the person to do the labs, then they go to the hospital. So in that regard, it's pretty really well in teaching. And because in our attempt to meet the 1990 type, then. It's very important that we facilitate ourselves because, for example, the first entity where people within the communities know that they are, they know their HIV status. Having them do it at the facilitated because you have quite a number of people who have a chip close by so that they can go there and do tests. So, the community of nurses been trained and give a rapid diagnosis test to the preliminary test. And if the person is positive, then the person can refer to the hospital to do the chemistry test, which else. And then also with the 1090, ensuring that you are positive out on treatment. That's also, as I said, by, by they being there and providing opportunity for refill, people are compliant. And we get the other tea where because they are compliant, the 90 can be at 50 percent of them at least who have viral suppression. So basically, this is really supporting HPK in Ghana. And the other part of it also is the elimination of child transmission, which was also very hospital hours. But then we really push them to do some touching and within the antenatal, because normally what was done is that they are, at the antenatal, the test is done. And when they are positive, then they are referred to the AR clinic. Now we've seen that it's not helpful. So the, the person doing the antenatal, do the test. If it is positive, then they start the treatment. Immediately start the treatment. They refer for if there any laboratory to be done. So the elimination of material transmission or hope is being integrated completely at the lower level. And I think all the other services, as I said initially, COVID really brought some of things down. And as we are picking up with all the things that I talked about initially, we hope that I mean we're going to really ramp up service and what needed. Yes, because as I said, the level of chips, the integration is already inherent in the way your business. Because the community of the the only health over there, and she does everything right from uh, of promotion, behavior, communication, immunization, data, for planning. I mean, it's, it's, all the services are offered at level, and including HIV care and TB, TB care also at that level. Yes, so under the level, I say, in connection with the chief contributing at that level to real ensuring geographical access be addressed. And also to extend final access. But if the person has the insurance card and he doesn't have money to travel to the hospital, then he doesn't benefit from his health insurance card. But then if he goes to the where the nurse, then he benefit using it. So it's so ensuring equity in terms of access 
both geographical and financial. Over, thank you. Great, thank you so much. And I think again, it's this really getting at this idea of, of this, what are the system redesigns and the fact that, um, you know, primary healthcare has sort of this role in both responding to, to COVID because often they're the first people who, who are, people are seeing, but also I think in making sure that we're either preventing, uh, mitigating or responding to, uh, to the threats of care. Um, Sonia, I have a question for you and reflects a little bit of, of one of the questions from the, from the audience. Um, a new UNAIDS report released um, at AIDS 2020 revealed that in 2019, about 62% of new HIV infections occurred among key populations and their sexual partners. And I was wondering if you could think about what are the opportunities um, for primary health care, um, you know, again, during, but also before and, and after uh, the COVID pandemic, um, how can integration of services at the primary care level better serve to reduce the risk of these groups from being left behind, accessing prevention, for example, pre-exposure prophylaxis, as well as care that might be more tailored to their needs? Sonia? Thank you. Um, in its evolution of, uh, as an organization, uh, the Global Fund um, explicitly recognized that uh, health systems are able to respond to uh, emerging epidemics and provide more integrated, people-centered uh, health services, with, um, which are essential to ensuring healthy, prosperous, and stable communities. Central to this approach is a mutual understanding of the importance of primary health care. Uh, there is an essential uh, relationship between disease control programs and primary health care the treatment and prevention of HIV, but also you know, uh, TB and, and malaria, often occurs at the primary, primary care level, which uh, uh, when services are not provided directly, primary health care serves at the hub of coordination for escalated speci special, specialty uh, secondary and ter tertiary care. There is also uh, an opportunity to ensure that a strong primary healthcare foundation is complemented by disease specific interventions that work in synergy, particularly for key populations who are often marginalized. Um, in Mali, for example, addressing the need of key population will continue to require complementing uh, uh, health facility services by disease specific outreach. Therefore, the Global Fund support building stronger linkages between civil society organization, providing prevention and care services to, to key populations and public uh, uh, community health facilities on the continuum of care and treatment. We have this policy of dual track financing, uh, the, the dual track financing modality of Global Fund grants has enabled stronger engagement of civil society in the design, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation, management, and governance of programs targeting vulnerable communities and key population, in, including key population-led service delivery. We have, we have to do more. You know, this is not ideal, but we have this, uh, this uh, modality. In the, in the West uh, Africa context, uh, investments need to address the, high levels of stigma and discrimination towards key populations and people living with the diseases, especially in the healthcare settings. For example, efforts can be focused in the development of uh, key population-friendly uh, services in, in primary healthcare facilities, finding the right places and the right providers and training of uh, healthcare providers. We have example of uh, you know, friendly clinics in, in, in countries of West Africa that are providing integrated services, not only uh, uh, for one specific population, but adapted to specific needs. Uh, in Mali, there are major financial and geographic barriers to access uh, healthcare and a very weak uh, health systems. To help address these uh, issues, Global Fund, uh, Gavi and the World Bank are partnering to invest in renovation uh, and strengthening community health centers, deployment of community health workers, uh, and strengthening a community-based organization to generate demand and to provide preventive and care services and ensure key populations and vulnerable populations are, are rich. This is a primary health care reform that I mentioned before. Uh, a key challenge to integration uh, sometimes 
I would say, are the disease programs themselves. Uh, vertical programs for the free diseases are often receiving large funding envelopes, uh, while cross-cutting health system strengthening is underfunded. There is no uh, health system department or a primary healthcare department in a Ministry of Health. And very often the service, health services or community health uh, teams uh, are less strong or less visible than the disease programs. The Global Fund is set to address these challenges uh, through the evolution of new strategies and increased investment in community health systems. Uh, we can see with uh, this uh, new funding cycle of the Global Fund, there's an increase, uh, increasing attention toward uh, primary health care and particularly on uh, increase and increase in community health investments in, in Western Central Africa. Over to you. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Sonia. Um, so, Laurel, Dr. Sprague, um, one thing that has clearly been emerging is that not just HIV, but other non-communicable diseases are being impacted negatively. And uh, particularly for people with HIV, issues around tuberculosis, but also rising rates of cardiovascular disease are really a challenge. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about, um, and again, I tend to look at the positive as opposed to the challenge. Uh, where have you seen um, emerging um, models that could be replicated? And if you could also touch, reflecting a question from the audience, on the potential role of digital health, um, both for sort of more rapidly sharing these successes, but also providing care uh, for frontline health providers, how to manage, uh, manage these diseases. Yes, a simple thank you. question. <laughs> well, no, but a question I'm very happy, uh, I'm very happy both questions have been raised. So, so thank you very much. Um, integration is a key um, aspect of, of uh, a key need for, for people living with HIV, and it's a key element of the 2016 political declaration on ending AIDS. Um, so we've um, integrated that idea of integration into our work at, at UNAIDS as well, uh, because it's so critical. Um, I, I, just to, to highlight, I think, um, with one example, how important this idea of integration is, or the need for integration is, um, there was a study done, I believe, last year or the year before in Cote d'Ivoire, looking at out-of-pocket expenses, health expenses, um, for people who were on antiretroviral therapy. So people living with HIV who were on antiretroviral therapy. And of those people, 26% um, of them also reported having a chronic non-communicable disease. And for those people, the cost for treating the NCD or NCDs in, uh, that they have was much more than the cost of, of treating HIV, or their out-of-pocket cost. Uh, so, and, and I think that that it speaks to something that Sonia was just expressing, which is, is the way that we're, and, and that Lillian brought up earlier, the way that we fund um, the disease response uh, creates differential burdens on people. Uh, but people living with HIV, even if they can get their HIV medications covered, end up with um, sometimes insurmountable costs for um, other health conditions that they have. But so to speak just briefly of, of some successes, um, TB HIV integration, um, I would say, is, is, a, is, a, is not a complete su success story, but I think it's a very good success story of integration, particularly um, from the point of um, uh, from the starting point of a TB clinic. So TB clinics now in high TB prevalence countries have very high success rates in terms of um, ensuring that patients with TB um, know their HIV status. And those who um, test positive for HIV, um, close to 85% or more of them are on HIV medications as well as their TB medications, which is some of the highest, it's some of the highest numbers in the world. It's it, what we're trying to get to with our 90-90-90 approach is that 90% of people, um, and ultimately 100% of people with diagnosed HIV have access to um, an antiretroviral, antiretroviral treatment. Um, so I think that's a success. Um, we've seen success with youth-friendly clinics um, that, that integrate um, family planning, STI services, and HIV services, much higher uptake of all of those services for young people um, than when those are offered separately um, and in a less youth-friendly way. Um, we've seen um, for family planning, as was men mentioned earlier, when family planning is integrated into HIV care, we see better success for both uh, uptake of family planning services, contraception, as well as HIV services. And when HIV is integrated into maternal and child health services, 
much better results for both mothers and, and for children. One thing I think is interesting for us to, to look at um, is, is, is where we need more data about how the integration is and is not working. And one example would be around cervical cancer, which is a um, AIDS-defining illness for women living with HIV, um, dangerous for women worldwide, but, but particularly for women living with HIV. When cervical cancer screening is included in HIV care, um, the, the numbers of diagnoses are much higher. Um, so, so that's a success story, but then if the, but the, the success ends there because we don't see, um, we see a lot of uh, women then lost to follow up after. So, so they get their diagnosis, but they don't get the cancer care they need. So we still have work to do and, and information is needed also around um, mental health integration with HIV, which is really needed, but we don't have a lot of information or experience on what works. Um, a couple key considerations, again, uh, community-led services, who provides the services? Um, when they can be provided by communities, especially key population communities, um, you know, we see great um, success in keeping and retaining people in care. Um, stigma and discrimination I mentioned already, criminalization um, I think was well mentioned by, by Lillian. Um, there are issues around location of primary health centers, the visibility of people when they're entering um, and their confidentiality. Um, for example, if people with HIV, if the clinic is known, if, if, if HIV day is on Tuesday and the clinic is around the side, everyone knows who's going. And of course there's a, a, a tremendous barrier to receiving HIV services in that kind of situation. Um, and clearly if you can't disclose your HIV status or that you're an LGBT person or um, you have experience of sex work or, or someone using drugs, then your right to health is compromised because your medical professional can't, can't help you with some of the things that you might need care for. Um, and so those things I, I think are really key considerations. Um, digital health, just briefly, um, I think everyone knows we need electronic medical records. Uh, that it, It's impossible to integrate services well when we're using paper and books and there's a TB book and an HIV book and a, a child vaccination book, et cetera it really forces people into, it forces systems to set up separate clinics and separate days for separate conditions, um, which is the opposite of integration. So, so in terms of um, digital health in that way, uh, really it's essential that, that electronic medical records are established, but also that there are real uh, reliable systems for security and that people have unique identifiers, not biometrics, ways that they can safely be tracked and, and with digital health we can really provide health with community-led services um, not just in centers but, but in the community where people are so um, as long as it's done properly I think it's a key innovation. Great thank you so much and I'm just going to wrap up because I want to hear uh, Jean's sort of overall summary but want to first of all thank very much our, our three panelists I think you've brought up very important issues about the need for really a uh, intersectoral response to um, to how do we sort of maintain primary health care for people living with HIV in the COVID era, whether it's policy, whether it's integration from the community, whether it's empowering the frontline providers, um, the importance of system redesign and really rethinking of how we're doing it uh, better to make sure that we're make, that we're focusing on the most vulnerable as well as as well as more broadly and some of the work that's really being led. Um, uh, by the community, by governments, by donors, uh, and, and other multilateral agencies. So really very important. There's been a couple of questions which we will uh, answer, uh, apologies, offline. Very important things about integrating hepatitis C and, and COVID among people living with HIV. There's some uh, emerging, emerging evidence whether it does or does not um, uh, whether it is or is not more of a problem. But I think overall, I think the, the challenges that we have facing ahead are both opportunities. I think one of the challenges to those opportunities is how do we more rapidly accelerate the learning uh, and accelerate the change? So things that we're finding from Mali or from Ghana or from Cote d'Ivoire, how do we make sure that those are then spread and emerged? There's some very interesting ways of using digital health both as, as an EMR, but also, uh, for example, treating COVID, there's a global discussion that as people are learning how to do these types of things, the art of medicine, uh, how do we actually continue to learn? And so how do we also do that for the art of, of HIV care and continuing to integrate um, primary care into HIV services, but also thinking about how do we integrate HIV into primary care services and which of those models is the most appropriate for the different contexts. I'm absolutely delighted and, and honored now to um, turn this over 
to, uh, to Jean uh, Kegaberi, who is a uh, colleague uh, from, from Primary Healthcare. He is the Deputy Director of Global Primary Healthcare S Systems at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Jean, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Lisa, for uh, your kind words, but also thank for, to the speakers and also panelists, but also want to really thank the PHCPI Secretariat for organizing this meeting. Um, I think after listening to the presentation also uh, on the uh, question and answers, uh, I would like to highlight a few key takeaways and also uh, some areas for further discussion. Uh, first of all, I would like really to encourage all of us to continue this close collaboration between the HIV and PHE communities to really to design a high quality, equitable and comprehensive models of service delivery uh, for the most vulnerable. Uh, as you know, as countries reevaluate the health priorities right now in the budget and the systems in light of COVID-19 and the in impact on economics, uh, it's really important to capitalize on this unique moment to re-energize conversation around building resilience health systems that would effectively meet the, uh, everyone's health needs. Um, I think it's also equ equally important that countries should focus really on strengthening primary health care systems to ensure that the comprehensive quality and equitable care for those living or affected by HIV, particularly the key populations and other marginalized groups. I think we noted during this uh, discussion today that uh, COVID-19 has really posed new challenges for those key populations to accessing care while also exposing the long-standing weaknesses in health systems' ability to reach everyone in need. And we know that uh, listening to some of the experience from Ghana, that it's affected, COVID is affecting both the demand, but also the supply side, including the providers, the disruption of supplies and so forth. I think we also saw the importance and the consequences of the non-communicable diseases, you know, diabetes, hypertension, and particularly in low-income countries, which, you know, can be effectively be taken care of by a strong primary health care systems, you know, just by doing simple preventions and early treatment. Um, we still today see a lot of fragmentations of initiatives and facts they were uh, one panelist who just, you know, cited several movements on the UHC movement, the PHC movement, the NCDs, the HIV movement. And I think it's time to leverage those and the synergies between them and also to create or co-create actually new health systems and also achieve their full potential. Um, I have also learned and heard a lot of about the focus on integration and also having a people-centered approach, uh, you know, that is designed by and with the people. Uh, we saw very good example and successes that were highlighted during the, uh, the discussion today, such as the community healthcare center model, the multi-sector multi approach and integration that we saw in Uganda, uh, the team approach and the community engagement uh, from South Africa that was highlighted by Professor Shabir, uh, the community health plans program in Ghana, where we have a really good example of integrations. Also listening to some of our key uh, global partners about some of the good example of integration uh, that were very successful about HIV, TB, family planning, MNCH, uh, but not so well maybe for the cervical uh, cancer screening. I think there was also a good recognition that they we should be able to put in place a favorable environment to have free access to services, particularly for the vulnerable group and key population. That could include actually uh, putting by legal means as well. And also I noted that the, as a clearly a, a, a global partners, uh, to name the few global funds, UNAID and others, were really placing more and more emphasis on uh, supporting countries to build resilient health systems. And with PHC as a focus, so as, as a foundation, which really provide uh, more opportunity for further integrations and synergies at the country level. And lastly, uh, we didn't really have a chance to discuss more, but I think one of the early panelists, you know, highlighted the importance of looking uh, at the financing, at the equity and allocation of resources, 
particularly with this diminishing revenues due to the COVID impact on the economy. So that could be another, uh, you know, action that we need to think as we are going to tackle the COVID and having the integration, what is the proper allocation of resources to both uh, disease and conditions, and also looking at the global lens on health financing and the UHC uh, goal. So I think, um, these are, I think these were my few key highlights and i uh, give you back the microphone. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, John. And Beth, I'm going to hand it to you for the final wrap up, I believe. Yes, great. Thank you so much, um, Jean. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you to all of our panelists and our speakers today. Um, this was a, an extremely thought-provoking discussion um, uh, and, uh, and not one we get to have every day. Um, but I think that uh, my key takeaway is that it's one that we need to have a little bit more, uh, maybe a lot more. So I want to thank everyone for starting off this conversation. Um, we'll send out some uh, follow-up information to you, including how you can access the recording um, if there were pieces that you missed and you wanted to, to watch again. Um, but we'll also send out some information on how to participate in PHCPI's online forum um, where we can bring up some of these issues and discuss them in a little bit more of a leisurely fashion and also loop in some folks who were uh, unable to, to be here with us today. Um, I also just wanted to call your attention to a link to a fact sheet on HIV and PHC that um, PHCPI uh, just prepared and put out today um, that's on our website. So I encourage you to take that um, and to use the messaging freely uh, and the points on there freely. Um, I think that uh, one of the things we're really hoping is to engender a little bit more conversation and hopefully um, a situation in which all those various communities and, um, and, and initiatives uh, and campaigns and movements are talking uh, off, the same, um, off the same sheet um, and, and starting to, to think, think uh, a little bit along the same lines um, about how we can work together um, to improve health for all. Um, and, uh, and, and what we can learn from one another. Um, so I think today has been a really important start to that conversation. Um, again, thank you to everyone who stayed with us. Thank you to everyone um, who spoke uh, and took time out uh, to participate. Uh, and I hope that this is just the beginning of the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, bye.